Hello, and welcome to the DK Fall 2023 preview. I'm Sarah Hunter, Books for Youth and Graphic Novels Editor at Booklist. Before we begin, I'd like to go over some technical details. Links to today's slide presentation and title list were included in the reminder email you received from Zoom one hour ago. Hmm. To download them, please open that email, scroll to the bottom, and click on the links located there. You can also download any slides and title list by copying the URL and screen it to your web browser. If you have any trouble, please contact us at webinars at booklistonline.com. The audience is in listen-only mode, but we welcome any questions you may have. On the bottom of your screen is a toolbar with a question for Q&A. If you have a question or need technical assistance, simply click Q&A and type your message into the box that appears. We will do our best to respond to all tech-related questions and we'll pass along all other questions to today's panelists so they can follow up with you after the webinar. Booklist offers closed captioning on all webinars. To enable or disable captions on your screen, please look for and click the live transcript icon on the toolbar mentioned earlier. From there, you can select show or hide subtitles from the menu that appears. If you choose to enable subtitles, you can adjust the size of the captions at any time by selecting subtitle settings. And finally, Booklist expects all participants to maintain an atmosphere of respect and fairness. Anyone who violates the standard of behavior, including engaging in any form of harassment, may, at the discretion of the organizers, be immediately removed. We have a wonderful event planned for you today, and we'll begin with a special interview. But first, I'm going to pass things off to Rebecca Sang, Education and Library Marketing Coordinator at DK. Thank you, Sarah. Hi everyone, thank you so much for joining DK's Fall 2023 School and Library Preview with Booklist. I'm so excited we have this opportunity for you to learn more about some of DK's upcoming titles and to hear a Q&A with author Jelani Memory. Jelani Memory is the founder and CEO of A Kids Co., a media company that creates books and podcasts to help kids and their grown-ups have meaningful conversations about things that matter. He is also the author of the best-selling book, A Kid's Book About Racism. Jelani is a passionate advocate for diversity, equity, and inclusion. He believes that all kids deserve to see themselves represented in the stories they read and hear, and that books can be a powerful tool for starting important conversations about race, identity, and social justice. Jelani has been featured in the New York Times, the Washington Post, and NPR. He lives in his hometown, Portland, Oregon, with his wife and six children. I'm so excited to now welcome Jelani onto the virtual stage for a Q&A with Booklist Books for Youth editor, Sarah Hunter. Welcome everyone, and please take it away. Thank you so much, Rebecca. And it's such a pleasure to talk to you today, Jelani. Uh, it's so wonderful to be here. Um, how are things in Oregon? Uh, good, hot, uh, just like the rest of the country. Um, so tell us a little bit about the origin story of this book. Yeah, uh, this book, a kid's book about racism, uh, has an unusual sort of birth. Uh, I wrote it for my six kids back in 2018. Um, yes, that's right, six kids, uh, which means my house is usually like a zoo. Um, but I have a really unique family, a uh, blended family, so four stepkids. Uh, and two biological kids. So my four step kids are white and my two biological kids are black. And I wanted to start a conversation with them about racism. Uh, I think every kid should be able to navigate that conversation, but I especially wanted it for my white kids to be able to navigate and especially for my black kids to understand their own experience and my experience especially. So I wrote it in a couple of weeks and I designed it myself and I used a print on demand service to print a copy for my kids, just one copy. And, and my kids had the most remarkable response to it. One, they loved it and it opened up all these new conversations, but two, they were like, dad, this is great. You should make more books and other big and hard to talk about topics. And that started my journey, not just as an author, but as a publisher and as, you know, someone creating stories for kids on some of the most important and challenging topics. That's a wonderful story. Your kids wanted you to be an author. <laughs> my kids wanted me to and and gave me, I think, the courage and um, the confidence to be able to do so. 
that's lovely. Um, so speaking of the design of the book, um, it doesn't have illustration. Can you talk a little bit about your approach to the design of the page spreads and why you chose to go in that direction? Yeah, you know, uh, there's a handful of reasons. One, it was out of convenience. I'm not an illustrator by trade. Um, and, and so I use the skills that I had at my disposal, which is design, which is use of type and color and layout. Um, but the second one is probably the more important, which is um, I think we as, as uh, grownups and specifically authors sometimes don't give enough credit to kids um, mm -hmm. around how they see the world and what they're capable of wrapping their heads around and understanding. Um, and so taking a topic like racism and trying to give an honest and authentic reflection of what that word means, what uh, the experience of racism is like, I wanted my kids and all kids to really take that seriously. Um, and, and I wanted them to take the topic seriously. I wanted them to take themselves seriously and the experiences around seriously. And so that meant, I think, trying to be as straightforward as possible. So as I navigated the design of the book and the writing of the book, it started to mean taking out some of the things that I thought could be distracting um, uh, and take away from the importance of the topic. Now, of course, what you lose there is potentially some engagement from kids, right? Uh, where are all the pictures? Why aren't there animals running around talking about this topic? Um, but what I found when you replace those illustrations with respect for kids and telling them something that very other, very few other grownups are willing to tell them, um, that they lean in, that they really engage in a remarkable way. And, and the lack of illustrations birthed something, sort of a third thing that I never could have imagined, which is kids fill in the blanks with their own lives. Instead of being locked into the characters or the story within the book, as they hear the story, they start thinking about experiences that they've had, things they've heard said in the classroom, uh, and, and are thus able to sort of leap out of the book in a really remarkable way after they finish, um, thinking and reflecting on their own lives. Yeah. And I think it's also important to note that it's not just that there are only words on the page. There's a lot of open blank space around like dynamically placed type. So there is like literal white space where you can fill in the blanks with your own imagination, which I thought was a really interesting. Yeah. Um, so a kid's book about racism is specifically designed for kids to read with grownups. And when we talk about books like this, we so often talk about what kids take away from it. And obviously that's very important, but what do you hope adults take away from this book? They're the ones who are going to be reading it with children. And I think they're as much of an audience as the kids themselves. Yeah, I, I think absolutely. Um, you know, I, I've long thought, look, I wrote this book in 2018. Um, so this is before sort of the summer of 2020, George Floyd's murder, protests in the streets, sort of the racial reckoning that our country went through. Um, and I think what happened at that moment was a lot of grownups realized that they didn't really understand how race worked or racism worked. And instead of being at a high school level or college level, they were actually at like a first grade level. And so there's something really magical about what my book's been able to do is actually not just meet kids where they're at, but meet a lot of grownups where they're at, where they're actually at that kindergarten, first grade, second grade level when it comes to their understanding of how racism works. And creating that as a foundation is a place that they can build from. And specifically when it comes to them reading a book with the kid in their life, whether they're a teacher or a parent or an auntie or an uncle or grandparent, um, it creates a shared language where now they're able to discuss and ask questions and dive deeper. And, and you know, we as grownups, we like to pretend like we know a lot of things. Um, and if we don't know it, we'll, we'll lie about it, um, especially when it comes to kids. And so my hope is, is and, and I've already seen this in action, is that grownups go, I've never thought about it that way. Or that's a really great way to explain it. And they can build from that, uh, uh, that very basic knowledge of uh, an open conversation about racism to grow from there. Yeah. There's also something really powerful about like a shared path of discovery between a kid and adult, working Absolutely. on things together and 
learning things together. I think that can be really empowering for everybody. Yeah. And kids will ask questions that grownups just won't feel brave enough to ask. Mm -hmm. And it causes this, you know, I remember my 11 year old son, he said, he's a dad. I, he goes, but why does racism happen? And I, and I tried to give him some fancy big answer and he goes, no, he goes, you don't understand. He goes like, why, like, why, why did it start in the first place? And I realized I had no answer for this. Like it was like, it was such a big question that I'd never thought to ask myself. That was the first question that came to mind for him. Yeah. Um, so what makes conversations like this about racism specifically, but any of the difficult or complicated or challenging topics you cover in the other books in the series, what makes them so intimidating for adults in the first place? Yeah. I think there are two reasons why conversations about racism are intimidating for adults. I think the first thing is, is we've got so much baggage when it comes to conversations like that. We, most of us have been taught that it's just not polite to bring up topics like religion and politics and race in conversation. And so we actually intentionally avoid these topics because they seem too fraught or too painful or too difficult. Um, and I think the second one, and I think any, any parent or teacher uh, will relate to this, is we are afraid of bringing up these topics, specifically racism with kids, because we are afraid of saying the wrong thing. We are afraid of saying it in the wrong way at the wrong time and somehow harming our kids in a way that you sort of can't take back. And, and so we bring that baggage, we bring that fear. And so it's no wonder when a kid points out somebody at the supermarket and goes, his color is different than mine. What's up with that? We go, no, 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 stop. Don't talk about that. And we try and whisk them away instead of engaging with them in a thoughtful way because of our own baggage, because of our own fear. Um, now the reality for kids is it's quite the opposite. There's just, there's curiosity. There's a thoughtfulness about it. There's, um, and there's a lack of fear when it comes to having these conversations. Um, and, and look, it's okay if you bring up racism and of course the legacy and the history of racism, specifically in America, if kids feel sad, if they feel upset or worried, those are normal, healthy feelings to feel um, that I don't think parents or grownups should be afraid of. Um, that's actually, it's totally healthy and normal for kids to feel that way. And in fact, when we don't bring up these conversations when it comes to race and racism, culture and color, we leave kids by themselves to think about these things alone, to navigate them alone. And of course, process them with their peers, which, you know, if your kid's in first grade, maybe their peers are not the best place to, you know, have only that conversation happen. Maybe there should be some safe grownups involved in that conversation. Yeah. Um, racism is such a huge topic, of course, as you have mentioned already. Um, what helped you keep the text focused in the book? Yeah, you know, I if I go all the way back to writing it, I remember toiling with this idea of going, there's so much to say about this. One, what gives me the right to even write about it? But two, how do I how do I say what needs to be said? And and I kept coming back to this idea of trying to keep it personal, mm -hmm. that I wasn't saying everything there was to say about racism. I was saying what I had to say about racism and from my own experience. And in that way, that led to the book being from a first person perspective. So I introduce myself, I say, hi, my name's Jelani and here's what this book's about. And we dive into it. And in that way, I'm localizing everything into my experience and hoping that grownups and kids can pull from that, but not presuming that they're, that I'm speaking for every black person who's ever experienced racism forever. Um, and then, you know, one other sort of approach was, uh, uh, I initially titled it the kids book about racism, uh, cause it, it was a sensible title. Um, mm -hmm. and I changed it to a kid's book about racism because I realized mine was one of many stories that could be told. Um, and I, and I couldn't imagine how fortuitous that would have been. And so what's really cool is my hope for that book when kids read it with a grown up is they leap out and they'll share their experience with racism or something they heard in class or saw on the soccer field that relates back to the book instead of feeling like the book is somehow the kid's Bible on everything there's to say about it. 
open open the world of possibility as opposed to like being definitive about it. Yeah, yeah. And and also this reality of like um there's there's I knew I had to start the conversation somewhere. But if you try and finish the conversation, then it's finished. And so for me, I wanted to leave it open-ended. I didn't want to solve racism. I didn't want to give kids all the tools for what they could do about it. I wanted to just start it and open up that aperture so that once that door was open, it wouldn't get closed again. And kids would ask really thoughtful questions that explore the topic. And of course, you know, a bug and annoy all the grownups in their lives to help go deeper on that topic. Um, and in that way, um, you know, I think of my book as a conversation starter as opposed to a conversation ender. Did you read any like preliminary versions with your kids and get feedback from them about what worked for them and what didn't? You know, I didn't. Uh, <laughs> and and maybe that would have been helpful or useful. <laughs> um, but um, uh, a little backstory. I grew up uh, you know, without a dad, dad left when I was four, we were raised by a single mom, us four kids. She worked nights as a nurse. And so we were left mostly to ourselves to sort of navigate as she slept throughout the day. And, uh, and, and we didn't talk about anything growing up. There just wasn't time. My mom didn't have the emotional bandwidth. So when I became a father, I decided I was going to have every conversation too early instead of too late. And so, I have I have pushed at the boundaries of what's sort of possible when it comes to my kids. Uh, I remember a, a drive. We were coming home from school one day and uh, my son, who at the time must have been maybe six, he said, Dad, what's a gentleman's club? Because we were passing by one. And my wife was like, no, you are not going to explain that. And I said, no, I'm I'm going to explain. I go, he's asking when will we ever get this opportunity again to sort of have this teachable moment? And of course, all of my kids are in the car and we had this really thoughtful conversation about our bodies and intimacy and even sort of broach sex. I mean, it's just like all the kids are here and, and I don't regret that at all in that approach because if you wait too long to have those conversations with the kids in your life, by the time you're ready to have it, you know, if they're 12 or 13 or 14, they're going to go, hey, like, I, you don't get to talk about this with me anymore. Mm -hmm. I've already learned about it from my friends or, you know, <laughs> thanks, but no thanks. <laughs> and so for me, the book was an embodiment of, of how I've tried to sort of act as a father um, because of my own experience with my kids and, and to watch their bravery in action, their sort of unflinching fearlessness when it comes to engaging with topics that make me feel uncomfortable um, and how they navigate it. So I wanted to infuse the book with that same approach. Yeah, that's a great segue to my next question, which is that um, a lot of people right now believe that topics like racism aren't appropriate for children, especially young children to learn about. And that's obviously not true. Um, but I'm wondering if there are any talking points that you can give to our listeners specifically that they can take back to their community members if they get if they get questions about books like this in their own collection. Yeah, yeah. I suppose there'd be maybe three points that I would give. I think the first is, is for children of color, specifically black and brown kids. Um, the conversation is not optional for them. They will like, directly experience racism um, from friends, family, peers, um, from uh, schoolmates, um, as early as three, four, five, I mean, as soon, as soon as they start school, they will experience it. I can say that from my own experience, and that is just categorically true. So having the conversation, is it better to let them experience it without having the conversation, or is it actually more important that you have the conversation with them? I think the second point is um, kids don't just learn stuff without learning it, and that'll sound sort of a little obvious, but the biggest retort I get to my book is like, well, just teach kids to be nice, teach them to be respectful and no racism will happen. And I sort of say, well, that's like saying, you know, uh, if a kid throws a rock, like don't say anything about it, just go, don't ever throw a pencil. Um, and you only bring it up when the pencil happens, but not the rock. It's sort of like it's splitting hairs in a way that's sort of nonsensical. Um, kids learn not to be racist by learning about how racism works. 
And the way racism persists is actually when kids aren't educated on it and they do what I like to call accidental racism, which is like they have no conception of what their actions or words mean. They are just perpetrating them without sort of that understanding around them. Uh, and then and then I think the third thing is, is what are you so afraid of? Um, you're afraid of teaching kids about things like, um, you know, uh, and that, you know, just credit to kids' creativity and curiosity and capability when it comes to learning about life itself. Um, and at that point, um, I don't think there is a too young. There's just engaging with the kid with where they're at and what they understand. And you'll find kids have very basic questions when they're young. I have a four-year-old and his questions are, uh, my my skin is brown. Why do people say I'm black, right? He, it's like really important for him to understand that. And so we can have a conversation about that. Um, and then as we, you know, progress and grow, that conversation gets more deep and more in depth. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I, I think the fact that kids are learning about so many of these things for the first time is something that a lot of adults can take for granted because yeah. they don't have the context um to understand why adults are acting weird about them yeah and they they need that context to have a grasp of you know why a grown-up might say something that seems off to them they kids recognize when things aren't weird and off. Okay. they are very good barometers of like emotional difference i've noticed yeah, they um, notice when when a topic is off limits, they will avoid it, right? They will notice how uncomfortable their grown up gets, and and look like let's just all be honest, it's we're not afraid of kids learning about these topics because somehow it's inherently bad for them to learn about them. Uh, many folks are too uncomfortable for themselves to learn about them, right? As grown ups, that is an untouchable topic that they'd rather not talk about it at all ever. And so the idea of kids talking about it, it's almost like, um, how could that be possible if I'm so uncomfortable talking about racism? How could kids be comfortable about it? Um, and the reality is, is they are. They're actually totally fine with it. Mm -hmm. And what's, I, I think there's also a lot of value in like recognizing that discomfort and acknowledging that it is yeah. an opportunity for you to like think hard about why that is happening. Kids, you're right, kids don't experience that um that's that's purely an adult problem <laughs> and um, <laughs> adults adults could really take a lesson from children I think in uh how they view the world and consider the world and think about their place in the world 100 percent um so we've talked we've been talking a lot about how kids react react to your book and I'm very curious if you can tell us about how you've seen kids respond to it and what you personally have taken away yeah, uh, I mean, it's it's just been absolutely incredible. Um, I make a habit uh, of visiting schools, and I've probably visited 30 plus schools doing assemblies this last year, sharing my book with kids and with teachers. And, um, you know, to see kids' thoughtfulness when it comes to the topic, to see their willingness and bravery to share their own experiences to to see that light bulb click on in a kid's head where they go oh that's why that thing happened and that person was upset and why and and that uh that radical empathy that i think kids have i see it happen over and over again because kids have such a great barometer for what feels just and what feels right and what feels good um and what feels wrong and um you know, as as uh, I've seen kids interact with my book, it's been really remarkable. And then one very strange, interesting side benefit that actually happened with my kids and has been like every assembly, every classroom visit goes this way too. My kids' second response after seeing my book and saying, dad, you should make more was, can I make one too? Mm. That something about me sharing my story had unlocked for them the permission the, the possibility of them sharing their own story. And so I end all of my assemblies typically with third, fourth, and fifth graders the same way, which is pitch me a book, pitch okay. me a, a kid's book about on something that you are an expert on, something that is important to you, something that matters. And you'd think it all be like a kid's book about Minecraft and a kid's book about candy and dinosaurs, but it's not. 
It's a kid's book about relationships, a kid's book about religion, a kid's book about um, uh, being happy, like these topics that are so heartwarming and important and that really matter. And you see kids come out of their shells in a way that I think is, is pretty remarkable. And so that for me, it's like, it's all I ever could have asked for getting to share my story and, um, and, and getting to see the, the eyes light up and, and little kids, uh, you know, when they interact with my book. That's wonderful. I have a, I have a three-year-old and she is a, a fountain of questions right now. I'm sure <laughs> you would benefit from uh, many books on many, many topics. <laughs> yeah. 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 They're incredible. Um, well, I believe that is all the time we have for today. Um, so thank you so much again, Jelani, for taking the time to talk with us and tell us about the book. And now I'll pass the mic back to Rebecca for the titleless portion of today's presentation. Take it away, Rebecca. Hi, everyone. My name is Rebecca, and I'm the marketing coordinator for education and library at DK. Thank you so much to Jelani Memory and Sarah Hunter for their wonderful and thought-provoking discussion about a kid's book about. And thank you so much to you all for tuning in to today's webinar. I am so excited for the opportunity to now share some of our available and forthcoming titles for both children's and adult. Now, before I dive in, I want to mention that if a book or series is available in ebook or as a Spanish language edition, this will be mentioned on the slide. Now let's begin with our children's titles. First up, I would like to re-highlight Jelani Memory's book, A Kid's Book About Racism, as seen on this slide, as well as the rest of the A Kid's Book About series, which explores conversations on the important and often more difficult parts of life. Topics in the series are handled mindfully, and the books are meant for children as young as five. Some of these are existing titles that are already out in the world, but by being under the DK umbrella, they will now be easier for you to obtain through your preferred wholesaler. In July and August, the books out will include a kid's book about racism, a kid's book about anxiety, a kid's book about disability, and a kid's book about imagination, the last of which is written by actor LeVar Burton. And in September and October, we'll have a kid's book about belonging, failure, gratitude, and life online. In November and December, we'll have a kid's book about body image, immigration, empathy, and gender. Next, I am so excited to present this title, The Eyewitness Encyclopedia of Everything, a next generation encyclopedia bursting with breathtaking photography and packed with knowledge on the topics kids love the most. Readers will encounter the world's greatest record breakers, the most deadly creatures, history's heroes and villains, and science's most incredible breakthroughs and inventions, all as they've never seen them before. As you can see, each page of this book is illustrated with jaw-dropping photography and layered with incredible facts and graphics. Though this encyclopedia is meant for kids ages 9 to 12, people of all ages, including myself, are sure to be enthralled for hours. This stunning encyclopedia will be out on September 5th with a Spanish edition to follow in the spring of 2024. Next, I'd like to highlight some other eyewitness books coming out this year. As you may know, two summers ago, the look and feel of the eyewitness series was updated with a new look, more facts, and more fun for today's generation of kids. However, this series still maintains the same well-loved approach of visually stunning, immersive knowledge built around a singular topic. Be sure to keep your eyes out for Eyewitness World War I, Reptile, Fossil, and Universe publishing this year. We are so excited that Rebel Girls is now a part of the DK family. Out on October 3rd, Dear Rebel is an inspiring collection of first-person stories for more than 125 notable teens and women. Through letters, poems, personal essays, self-portraits, and more, the authors share their advice and experiences on overcoming obstacles, discovering your passion, and dreaming big. Learn about how Miss Marvel actor Iman Balani connected with her heritage through her character, 
read about how March for Our Lives co-founder Jacqueline Corrin found her voice as an activist. Follow mountaineer Carla Perez on the final 100 meters to the top of Mount Everest. Hear from Drew Barrymore, Melinda French Gates, Kat Sadler, and many more women in their own voices. Intended for readers ages five through 10, this rich collection will inspire young readers to try new things, face their fears, and be themselves. Next up, we have the DK Super Readers. In the wake of all the learning loss that children have experienced as a result of the pandemic, our new and improved nonfiction leveled reader series couldn't come at a better time. The DK Super Readers, an evolution of the ever popular DK Reader Series, is designed for kids ages three to 11 and are now divided into five levels from pre-level to level four. The five DK levels are also aligned to Lexile measures. All 125 titles published this year cover science-based topics from dinosaurs to natural disasters to wild animals to inventions and AI and more. We will also publish six Spanish bilingual editions of the DK Super Readers this August, three pre-level titles and three level one titles. We are really excited to have this added offering to support bilingual learners. And for a full list of titles available in 2023, you can use the QR code on this slide or visit the link. All English language titles are available in hardcover, paperback, and ebook. Plus, don't forget to visit the Super Readers website available on this slide and also on the back of every DK Super Reader via a QR code. The site holds tons of information and free downloadable resources for parents, educators, and librarians. From reading guides to achievement certificates and mass cutout crafts, these resources will help kids become reading heroes. Next up is The Timekeepers, DK's brand new chapter book series for kids ages seven to nine. The Timekeepers are a secret organization of kids who keep the course of history on track, all while a villain named Delay is set on causing chaos. While the hands on their special watches start to spin backwards, the timekeepers know that delay is up to no good and it's up to them to make things right. With a range of exciting adventures that span all of history, the Timekeeper series is the perfect mix of fictional story and historical facts. The books even include a reference section with more information on the historical topic to extend readers' interest. The first two books in the series, First Flight and The Ancient Olympics, will be available this September. An anthology of our extraordinary earth, the next in our beloved DK anthology series will be out this October. Written in clear and lively prose, this book unlocks the mysteries of our incredible planet, from rushing waterfalls to magical dark caves to our lush green rainforests. The book also examines the effects of climate change and what we can do to save our planet. Like the others in this series, this book will feature foil on the cover, gilded edges, and a ribbon for keeping your place. This book is perfect for budding geologists, geographers, environmentalists, and all around planet Earth enthusiasts everywhere. This encyclopedia is a special one. Elmo Asks Why, for kids ages three to five, will dive into the fascinating answers to questions from why be sting to why we should brush our teeth and many more with Elmo and friends. This first encyclopedia is bursting with exciting information and fascinating photographs about our wonderful world to help little learners grow smarter, stronger, and kinder. Next up, we have Phonic Books, a recent addition to the DK family. Phonic Books offers an exciting range of decodable books for beginner readers and older readers. With multiple series that build on learned letter sound knowledge, Phonic Books paves a structured scaffold that can be effectively integrated into any phonics instruction program. While all of the Phonic Books titles are available in paperback, six sets of Phonic Books will now be pub published with library binding. Three sets are for beginner readers ages five through seven, 
while these other three sets are for older readers ages 8 through 14 plus and feature age-appropriate illustrations and storylines that support older readers who need to bridge gaps in phonics skills. And this is just a reminder that DK's Spanish language publishing list continues to grow both on the children's and adult sides. Highlighted here are just a few of this year's forthcoming and newest. Now let's dive into our top fall adult title picks. First up, we have some cookbooks. Baking Yesteryear is a truly one of a kind cookbook that is making and baking history. Several thousand copies ago, this book already broke a record for the most pre-ordered cookbook in Penguin Random House history. With over 13 million social media followers, B. Dylan Hollis is a fan favorite star baker. His decade by decade cookbook, Baking Yesteryear, highlights the best and a few of the worst 101 baking recipes from the 20th century. Publishing at the end of July, this cookbook is a must have for every adult library collection and can even serve as a gateway to a history lesson in the classroom. Make everything from chocolate potato cake from the 1910s to avocado pie from the 1960s and go on a delicious journey through the past. Dylan has baked hundreds of recipes from countless antique cookbooks and selected only the best for this bake book. With a larger than life personality and comedic puns galore, baking with Dylan never gets old. We'll leave that to the recipes. Number one New York Times bestselling author, Joshua Wiseman is back with 75 spectacular recipes and an entirely new exploration of culinary experience. His second cookbook, Texture Over Taste, will take your taste buds and kitchen to an entirely new level. Now, everyone knows flavor is important to making a dish shine, but there's also a secret element that elevates food into an experience you'll never forget. It's texture. When flavor meets texture, the eating experience evolves into something entirely new and fantastic. In Texture Over Taste, Wiseman introduces readers to the key elements of flavor, then dives into the six fundamental textures that create some of the greatest food experiences of all time. Crunchy, chewy, aerated, creamy, fluid, and fatty. With Joshua, there is no compromising. He'll challenge you to think about food in an entirely different way. You'll experience cooking exactly as it's supposed to be fun, and maybe even a little dangerous. Next, I'd like to give a special shout out to DK's New York Times bestselling books of 2023. Knife Drop by Nick DiGiovanni, Healthy Girl Kitchen by Danielle Brown, and Meal She Eats by Tom and Rachel Sullivan. These cookbooks are all available now. Next, welcome to Safe and Sound, the renter-friendly guide to home repair by Mercury Stardust, AKA the trans handyman. Renting a home can be a complex process. And for many people, the simple act of contacting a repair person can feel like a game of chance. As a trans woman and a professional maintenance technician, Mercury Stardust has discovered the hard way that we live in a world with too much fear. If you've ever panicked about opening your door to strangers to fix a maintenance issue, this book is for you. You deserve to feel empowered to take matters into your own hands, and it's not as hard as you might think. In this book, Mercury will show readers how to tackle projects from how to properly fix a clog in their sink, to safely hanging things on walls, to patching drywall holes, and more. The overall message of Safe and Sound is one we should all always remember. A little bit of knowledge can go a long way toward making you feel more safe and in control of your own life. Safe and Sound will be available at the end of August. Next, I'd like to introduce you to some of the latest in DK Eyewitness travel. When's the best time to visit New York City? When are the Canadian Rockies at their most beautiful? Turn the pages of Where to Go When, the Americas, and you'll discover the answers to all these questions and more. Following a month-by-month -month structure, this easy to use calendar format highlights the perfect time to visit 100 of the America's favorite places 
including the frosty fringes of Canada, idyllic Caribbean isles, the vibrant cities of Central America, the epic landscapes of South America, and more. Also in this series is Where to Go When, Great Britain and Ireland. Following the same monthly format, you'll find ideas for every traveler, whether you want to hike through the highlands of Scotland, witness the wild coast of Wales, or explore the ancient heart of England. In the Screen Traveler's Guide, step inside your favorite movies with this travel guide for the ultimate screen geek. Meticulously researched and compiled by super fans and travel experts, the Screen Traveler's Guide maps the real life location between your favorite shows and scenes. Follow the Avengers Battle of New York, find out how New Zealand transformed into Lord of the Rings, Middle Earth, and much more from pop culture's cornerstones with this travel book. We also have new additions to the Like a Local series, including guides for Rome, Seoul, Boston, and Vancouver. This stylish travel guide series is buzzing with each city's best destinations and secret spots, from local neighborhoods to arts and culture to the best local food haunts and so much more. Plus, check out the newest additions to our popular DK Eyewitness Top 10 series, including Berlin, Cancun in the Yucatan, London, Delhi, Venice, and so many more. Make the most of your travels with this pocket-friendly series that makes planning a breeze with simple up-to-date themed lists of 10 that cover the best of each city, these guides will ensure you don't miss a thing. Now, if you're a Marvel super fan like me, get excited for Marvel Studios, the Marvel Cinematic Universe and official timeline. The Marvel Cinematic Universe or the MCU is vast, incredibly varied and richly complex. Different worlds, different timelines and countless characters. This is the guide to that universe. Created in close collaboration with Marvel Studios, this treasured keepsake will follow the entire story of the MCU from before the Big Bang to the blip and beyond. And last, but certainly not least, is Aircraft, the definitive visual guide, which was chosen as one of Library Journal's best reference titles of 2022. The updated edition, of this visually stunning and fact-packed book covers the history of more than 800 of the greatest aircraft ever made, from the first prototype to today's supersonic jet. Aviation enthusiasts of all ages will be captivated by DK's aircraft as they take an action-packed journey through the history of planes and the intrepid pioneers who made a dream a reality. Aircraft is available now in hardcover and ebook. Now, before we head off, here's a quick reminder to follow DK on social media to receive all the latest DK news and offerings. For any school librarians attending today, be sure to check out our education-focused site, DK Learning, which is packed with curated free content for educators, all browsable by grade level, subject, and topic. And don't forget to follow us on our education-focused, on our regular social accounts as well. This year, we launched a new channel, DK Living, on Instagram and Facebook. This channel is dedicated to adult lifestyle and reference titles, so be sure to give us a follow if that interests you. And thank you so much to everyone for joining today and for all that you do for your students, patrons, and community. We appreciate you. And a huge thank you again to Jelani and Sarah for their wonderful Q&A and for adding so much to today's webinar. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you so much for sharing those wonderful titles, Rebecca. Tomorrow, all attendees will receive an email containing links to today's video recording, title list, slide presentation, and a certificate of completion. For more about Booklist webinars, be sure to visit www.booklistonline.com webinars where you can view archives of past webinars and register for upcoming ones like those you see here. <clears throat> it's Graphic Novels and Libraries Month here at Booklist. Celebrate with us by attending one of our graphic novel themed webinars, read our Graphic Novels and Libraries Month supplement, currently free and open to all on our website, and enter our hashtag read graphic sweepstakes for your chance to win free swag from our sponsors. 
visit our website for more details. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar. And one more huge thank you to our guest, Jelani Memory, and to our sponsor, DK. This concludes today's webinar. See you next time.